Hey, welcome to the channel. In this video, we're going to look at four ways to build dependent dropdowns, the kind where you need to fill in one before the second one gets populated and so on. And one of them is going to blow you away, I promise. At my first Rails job, I worked for a company that was building a car repair app. This was in 2008, and back then the only way to create a dropdown for choosing a car's make, model, and year was to use JavaScript. And here's why. The problem with these kinds of dropdowns is you cannot load everything from the database in memory because there is a lot of data. Just for this simple example, there are more than 15,000 records you need to keep in memory. And you're probably going to ignore a lot of it because you only care about one car, not all of them. Then there is the size of the payload. For every new request to this page, you're going to have to download a huge HTML file. So because you have to download such a big file, it's going to be slow as well. And we want our sites to be super fast and responsive. In other words, this is not good. We can do better. One thing we can do is to load the data conditionally, which brings us to our first method using inline JavaScript. But before we look at the code, I want to take a few seconds to let you know that if you're looking to shortcut your learning curve with Rails, I'm building a new course for you which includes Hotwire and all the new features in Rails 7. I'm going to put the link in the description if you want to check it out. Now let's continue looking at the inline JavaScript method. The logic behind this form is simple. We have three select fields and each one has an onChange event handler. Whenever the user changes one of the dropdowns, the entire form gets submitted. And then on the back end, we're looking at the params. If there is a make set, we fetch it and then we fetch all the models for that make. We set the instance variable and reload the page. That's how the second dropdown gets populated. When the user picks a model from that second dropdown, we repeat the process. We submit the form again, find the model using the params, fetch all the years for that select that make and model, set the instance variable and reload the page. And then the last of the three dropdowns gets populated. Finally, when the user picks the year, we submit the form again, find the year, set the instance variable and reload the page. But now we also display a message because the year instance variable is set. And every time we find one of these attributes, we pre-select it in its respective dropdown so it doesn't reset. But that's all there is to this method using inline JavaScript. Now the next step up would be to use a little bit of stimulus.js to remove that inline JavaScript code, but we're going to keep everything else the same. So what we can do is create a stimulus controller and connect it to the form using this data controller attribute. Then we intercept any change event that bubbles up from inside the form and we handle it using a stimulus action, which just submits the form. And that's all there is to this method. I think it's an improvement because you don't clutter your HTML code with JavaScript. All your JavaScript logic is nicely decoupled from the HTML. But even though both the inline JavaScript solution and the stimulus one get the job done, I don't like the fact that they reload the entire page every time we change the dropdowns. So if we had more stuff on the page, maybe other forms and things like that, this solution would be far from ideal because it would probably reset other forms and who knows what. So what else can we do? Well, we could use a lot more JavaScript and some JSON endpoints to fetch the data and then populate the dropdowns in response to user interaction. So for that, I would add three routes, one for makes, one for models, and one for years. And then I'll connect those to JSON endpoints that return the data I want. And then the heavy lifting is done inside the stimulus controller where we fetch the data, listen to events, and populate the dropdowns. So when the stimulus controller connects to the form, it populates the list of makes by fetching them from the JSON endpoint and building the options list. Then when a change event is triggered on the makes dropdown, it calls the make action, which fetches the list of models from the endpoint and creates the options list for the models. And the process is the same for the models dropdown. Whenever a change happens, the model action gets called and it fetches the years from the endpoint and then it builds the options list. Finally, when the year is selected, the year action is called, which builds the final message and shows it on the page. The problem with this approach is it's too JavaScript heavy. And to me, the purpose of Hotwire is exactly the opposite of that to get rid of unnecessary JavaScript and build apps faster than you would if you were to do it with JavaScript. Even if we would refactor the solution to use slightly less code, it's still going to be a lot more work than it should, 
or than the hotwire alternative, which we're going to look at next. So I left this for last because I think it's amazingly simple. It builds on the second solution where we still submit the form via the stimulus action, which is just one line of code. And then the only thing we need to do is wrap the form in a turbo frame tag. That's it. Everything else stays the same, so we don't care if there's more stuff on the page because this solution won't affect the other elements, just the frame. I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope you can see what Hotwire is going for. To me, it's an escape from the crazy world of single page apps and an amazing productivity tool for solo developers and small teams to build very responsive applications super fast. If you want to see more videos like this, check out my Hotwire playlist, which I've linked in the description below. Bye.